you so much and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to E4M for giving us this opportunity to discuss the future of programmatic and the transformation we have seen so far and the transformation we can expect in future as well. Um, so before we begin, can we have a very quick round of introductions? You know, uh, your priorities in terms of, you know, programmatic and uh, you know, your exposure to programmatic so that everyone understands the group that we are speaking with. Hi everyone, I'm Tisha. I manage digital and D2C for Keristas India, which is a part of the L'Oreal group. Uh, I have been uh, in the digital space for about 10 years. So my journey with programmatic started before programmatic when we used to do data collection on Excel sheets. And it's been a long journey from there. And uh, of course, all our priorities now are around data collection and how do we best optimize that. So that's what I'm looking forward to discussing with all of you today. Hi, uh, I'm Varda. Uh, I run the ads business for uh, Big Basket and I'm also in charge of customer engagement. As far as programmatic goes, I've seen through sort of three phases in the last eight years. The first was when we opened up more and more sort of segments of data. The second phase where I think creatives became a little more sort of dynamic. And the third phase, which as yet, I think there are different versions going around with generative AI, with dynamic creatives and sort of contextualized ads where you're able to talk to someone as though you go, you're holding a real face-to-face -face conversation. So uh, my sense is we are in for a very exciting sort of disruption when it comes to programmatic. I just don't know which way it's going to be. I can give you a bunch of options. You pick and choose the ones that you like. Okay, hi, good morning everyone. I'm Ritika. I work with Dr. Eddies. Um, I have been in the digital marketing space for about 19 years now. Um, so yes, I understand the fundamentals of programmatic and then I've been thrown into uh, various uh, use case scenarios of uh, programmatic. Uh, for me, it's been really, um, you know, how it fits into the consumer journey and uh, more importantly, and how am I able to kind of see it in a single funnel. Um, have I really achieved that? No. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping to learn from this panel and probably, uh, you know, uh, discuss with you what my learnings are. Hi, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Soumya Patnak. Uh, I'm heading the marketing in Blinkx and in the digital space for almost uh, 18 years now. Uh, to me, the programmatic has been a, like, uh, as everybody has said already, that uh, there has been a, quite a bit of shift happened in programmatic over the years of last eight or 10 years, uh, which we have all transformed and have gone through. I think uh, down the line, the AI will play a very significant role in programmatic also, uh, like all of our life, right? Uh, I would like to explore more about it and talk uh, on those fronts to you guys. Looking forward for an excellent session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Lala Chendu. Uh, I'm CEO of Performix India. Um, we are a digital native agency uh, with DNA in performance marketing. And uh, due to that, programmatic uh, plays a very critical role in our portfolio. And frankly, my personal view of programmatic is uh, this the best marriage of media and technology. This is how actually uh, digital should work. Uh, I'm quite excited about this topic and looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, hi, Deepak Sharma. Uh, unlike probably the others on the stage, I'm not a marketing, marketing guy, but I do marketing as from the digital lens, uh, pretty much like what Lalatandu said. Uh, I do run digital assets for the firm, including uh, whatever financial products gets discovered, but more importantly from technology lens. And uh, I do see there are still a lot many problems we haven't solved while we'll talk about it, but I think there's one universal problem that we are all grappling with, finding the right customer at a lowest unit cost and uh, ensure that there is an ROI which can remain undisputed in the organization as to how this gets delivered. I think that's in irrespective of industry, that's uh, something universal. Uh, I think the second thing that we are grappling with is largely what I call internally the AIM. Uh, a large part of A, which is awareness, is, is getting solved, but the intent and the motivation to buy and convert that into finally the end product uh, is where still we have a lot of ground to cover. So hopefully we'll talk about that. Hi, my name is Priya Bhatia and I'm heading business development for OpenX. 
which is a SSP platform, and I'm based in Singapore, so I've just been added to this panel. Thanks, guys, uh, for having me. Um, so we're right in the middle of programmatic. Um, you know, an SSP platform is um, the one that connects publisher premium inventory to the buy side platforms, which are the DSPs. Uh, and that enables, uh, you know, an advertiser to buy advertising on the programmatic channels. It could be any of the omni channels, like it could be CTV or it could be mobile web or mobile apps in real time, targeting the right audience. So I think the entire premise of programmatic uh, was to target the right audience, um, you know, at the right time. And then that's something that, um, you know, it gets kind of lost uh, when, when people start to target through uh, programmatic and, and buy through this medium. So we'll discuss more on that. Thank you so much, everyone. So uh, there you have it, guys. We have the perfect panel here to discuss where programmatic is headed. So let's start off with the very first thought that I had in my mind. Programmatic has seen a lot of journey through the ages. But then, what is programmatic what is programmatic's journey to you? How have you tapped into programmatic? How have you evolved programmatic within your organizations? Is what I wanted to understand. So can we start with uh, Priya? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, we've been waiting for the day programmatic will really be evolved and, and you know, kind of adopted. Um, and, and that's the case in some of the more mature markets. When you look at the US, uh, EMEA, like a lot of the budgets go towards programmatic. Um, and, and, um, and, and that's not happening um, in the same way in, in the APAC region, I would say. Uh, and I'm talking about India and other Southeast Asia markets. Um, there's still a gap because of the understanding. So I think what needs to evolve is every, everybody needs to understand how programmatic can be used the, in the most efficient way, um, where you're achieving you know, your objectives as a marketeer. Uh, in the best possible way. So that, that journey needs to happen where the understanding of programmatic, how it's used to its best potential, can be discovered by marketeers. Thank you so much. That's perfect, actually. And Deepak, if you could just uh, take the mic, because what you just mentioned earlier, uh, that you know, at the end of the day, it's ROI that we are looking out for, right? That's what marketing is all about. So if you could just tie that in together with the ROI conversation you were saying. Yeah, I think uh, we are seeing a transition, especially as uh, organizations are investing massively on the CDP, because one of the biggest challenge when you go for programmatic was you don't even have the right data about you know the customers, their profile, their intent, uh, basis that you decide what kind of communication or a medium uh, or probably content do you want to play on. So I think the CDP part uh, largely is now sorted, as I would say, for most organizations who are ahead of the curve, especially if they are dealing with large consumer uh, segments. Uh, still, for business segment, that has not been done. So let me take qualify it. The consumer is OK if you are still targeting small businesses yeah. or medium-sized enterprise, uh, difficult problem to solve. Uh, so I think that we have solved for. I think what we are also seeing increasingly is uh, while there are challenges that we see on frauds, mm -hmm. on programmatic, and we will talk probably in the next uh, sector, but uh, I think there is a fair amount of learning that is coming in as to uh, what kind of click frauds and stuff like that you get to see. So thereby, uh, I think the third, we are also realizing that it's no more about uh, looking at only a cost of a display or a cost of a lead. Uh, but it's also about where you want your brand to be and where you don't want your brand to be visible. Uh, so I think ability to, because you don't want uh, your brand to probably be on a, some site that is probably reputationally not or, or from the persona of the brand is not the right place to be. So I think some of those real-time data as to how programmatic is working beyond just the matrix of ROI is another area that we are seeing. So organization, I think, is now realizing it's a 360 degree marketing and it's not just about uh, buying media through programmatic, but understanding the customer, the media, the content, building all your A-B testing modules, getting the real time data of what customers are seeing where. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the journey. I would still say we have a long way to go from where we are, but we have made reasonable progress. Thank you so much. Nice. So yes, uh, Lala Tendu, uh, 
Now that you know, we have can understood I, where. I yes, please. This question first, yeah. a little bit, because um, Deepak, you raised a point that it's a journey, right? And if I reflect on the journey, I see in programmatic there are three innovations which has happened, mm -hmm. which is making programmatic much more uh, effective, right? Number one, if you look, the inventory has increased. Mm -hmm. Now you see, you can do CTV, you can uh, do direct uh, digital out of home, everything is bundled, right? Yeah. Earlier it was just website and we were just doing some fancy thing there. So there's a lot more areas you can reach through programmatic. Second, I would say is the contextual targeting um, because there are a lot of third party data providers that have come. Uh, Epsilon is in the room somewhere I hear and um, Lotame or Sid Tag. We work with these players also to identify the right audience to target. And lastly is the personalization aspect, right? All of us want and uh, programmatic gives a very nice way to do dynamic creative optimization, be it by weather, be it by your audience type and so on and so forth. These, if I reflect in last three, four years, makes programmatic a lot more effective than what it used to be. Mm -hmm. But the challenges as uh, both of you kind of address is there are still attribution problems, fraud prevention, which I'm sure you're going to address <laughs> in BAV. Uh, but but as, as Deepak, you nicely put, it's a journey, but I see a lot more positive steps forward when it comes to programmatic. Thank you. Yes. That's bang on target, actually. And I want you to understand, you know, the journey that we have seen and the journey that we are going to see. I wanted you to, if you could just summarize your thoughts on the digital transformation we are seeing. We have seen and we are seeing in programmatic. That's exactly what you have done, actually, as a matter of fact. So uh, if you could uh, also shed some light on what else can we look forward to in terms of you know the changes coming in the industry, what are we looking forward to? What can we expect? And what are the core areas of focus? Not only for Performix as an organization, but then overall for the programmatic community. That would be great. So listen, uh, you, you are asked multiple topics. One, you <laughs> touched on digital transmission, which I think is a very broad word and often misused, right? Uh, if you ask Deepak what is digital transmission, you probably start with value the tech build, data, probably a marketer like would think, you know, it starts with marketing, media, and all that. So I'll, I'll not step into that conversation, but a very simple definition for us is, how do we reach customers where they are? As in, if they're on a digital platform, how do I effectively reach them? If they're visiting a mall, how do I effectively catch them in my offline store, right? It's as simple as that. And we are talking about getting to customer who are actually conversant with digital. In there, I see there are multiple challenges. I've already said the positive steps. Um, the old gardens by all these tech platforms is a problem. I'll give an example. The data I get from uh, Google ecosystem, if I run it against a Nielsen DAR, which is based on meta, numbers don't match, right? And the viability score, the impressions, everything come different. How do you reconcile with that? Then there is, if I have, as a user, if you have multiple uh, tabs open on your browser, everything counts as an impression. But practically, you cannot see, uh, right? Catch the impression in all the tabs. Mm -hmm. So all those are issues, and um, fraud prevention and all, Deepak has already spoke. So in short, uh, right, whether we call it under digital transmission or a simple application of technology to be really effective mm -hmm. in our marketing, um, Programmatic is the way forward, but there's a lot of things that needs to be addressed. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, I completely agree with all those things that you just said, but <clears throat> the only thing I was uh, thinking about in my head is when you ask this question, what is programmatic? I came very uh, mentally prepared to say that, okay, programmatic is anything that we are buying with biddable media, CPC, CPM. <laughs> Okay, that is what programmatic is. In fact, I made a conversation to Priya saying that only 20, 25% of India is using programmatic. But now I'm thinking and I'm hearing these gentlemen talk and technically why are we assuming that Google and Facebook are not programmatic, right? Um, technically they do do real-time bidding. We do play on bids. We play on targeting as much as possible. The ecosystem is changing. Google is probably going to take off, probably going to take off its uh, you know, audience data. But uh, the fact is that they, those are pro programmatic channels as well. 
Um, what we need to be really sharp about and you know push back on the marketing folk is the fact that give us a very specific TG who you think is relevant. I will find that for you uh, because there are enough data partners today kind of you know opening it up for us. And be specific and sharp in terms of what is that consumer journey that you want that specific TG to go through. So I think that is the real transformation that we have seen. You know, like, right only from saying, like, you know, there was this lovely meme, Steve Jobs and somebody else, uh, you know, demographic-wise, I want to say it was uh, Michael Jordan or somebody in the sports community, right? Demographically, they kind of fit so well, but uh, behaviorally uh, and any other attribute, they did not match at all. So uh, it's exactly that transformation that we have seen from moving into just media planning, which possibly the TV generation has kind of, you know, uh, pushed us to, and now going a lot more sharper with our TG and then finding a lot more, that's the transformation I feel, thanks to programmatic, which has happened. Thank you. So, uh, so Soumya, what are your thoughts? What is your perspective on, uh, you know, the transformation that you have seen? And just adding on to what Lala Tendu said and what Ritika said, you know, first of all, it's absolutely true. It's not only the wall gardens, it's not, you know, we don't talk about uh, the medium because programmatic is not a medium, it's a concept. It's the idea of buying ads programmatically, telling the system that this is the target audience that I'm buying for. And Facebook, whether it be Facebook, whether it be any digital marketing, you know, uh, platform within the ecosystem, at some point it follows the same principles. So that is why programmatic is a concept and it's not really a medium. So keeping that in mind, the transformation that you want to see in future, apart from what the Latin and Ritika have mentioned. Yeah, uh, I think uh, many points already covered by uh, all of all of the, the uh, uh, fellow panelists. So I think one of the interesting point you have just co covered is, uh, so Google and Facebook, the way Meta, Google and Meta, the way they are operating, right, the kind of platforms and kind of channels they are providing. Uh, I think they're going to a direction of programmatic eventually, right? I mean, if you see the kind of uh, new advertising uh, channels and everything they are bringing in, they, they, they do tend to go into that direction in a big way. And uh, if you see nowadays, like all of us know, right? I mean, targeting uh, your goal, your assets, plays a significant uh, role in the overall programmatic uh, landscape, right? Uh, those are the three, three four important uh, things which we have to make sure that this works perfectly okay. Then only your programmatic works perfectly fine in terms of the way you are trying to achieve your KPIs, right? Now, uh, if you see in the recent times, right, the way AI has been used by Google and Facebook in all of their uh, platforms, right, uh, whether uh, uh, AAA campaign for Facebook or say app installation campaign for Google, right? So those are again, pretty much programmatic only, but probably the limitation is in terms of the uh, the uh, asset they have, right? Uh, Google and Facebook, that is limited to that piece of uh, assets only. But uh, in terms of, uh, if you go to other programmatic uh, platform, right? Uh, they have much larger assets and everything. But uh, in terms of our organization, we have been using programmatic in a significant way. And uh, I think the data plays a very significant role in that. So in terms of uh, touching the customer in right point, right, CDP, as uh, Deepak just mentioned, right, uh, CDP plays a very significant role because uh, we are able to capture all the touch points user is doing in our assets and uh, that, that, that's a kind of personalization and communication you can uh, generate from those kind of uh, data points you are ca gathering, right. So I think, yeah, programmatic is a journey which we all are going through and uh, yeah, all uh, ecosystem, I'm sure that that will help us to move into that journey in a positive direction. Thank you, Samia. So uh, we have actually, you know, I personally have seen the journey of programmatic from very close quarters. So I have seen the days when, uh, uh, in fact, one of my clients, just the moment I entered into the meeting, he said, Array, our programmatic is problematic. So. From that, now I'm seeing it moving into the pragmatic zone rather than being programmatic, you know, problematic. So that journey, a lot of the points that were covered here by uh, the members of the panel here are encompassed in that journey, which is usage of data, yeah. reaching out to the core audience, identifying what to do, what data are we using, and how are we tying it together with our marketing goals. 
So, Varada, what are your thoughts on the measurement, the attribution analytics in place for programmatic and what can we look forward to? Sure. Uh, I think that's a good question. I think uh, I was anyway going to sort of come to that. Uh, I think, uh, in my view, three things are sort of emerging as a trend. I think I have precious little to sort of add to uh, what each of the folks over here said. You know, CDPs, which is first party data, you know, think of it this way. You know, think of it like a sugarcane vendor, right? Who, you know, the sugarcane juice vendor who started off, right? Someone came and said, hey, you know, so why don't you start maintaining a database of all the customers who speak sugarcane juice from you, which is CDP, right? And then someone said, hey, why should you just squeeze sugarcane alone? Add some ginger and lime, right? Which is first party slash second party data. So instead of selling the sugarcane juice for 20, you could sell it for 30, right? You're getting a disproportionately better sort of ROI, right? And third came personalization, right? Why should I just sort of give you the capacitors? Why don't I do a Starbucks, write your name, make you a little sort of, a little sort of more special? I think the thing that we haven't quite gotten used to, right, uh, which I can sort of grapple with because e-groceries is probably one of the hardest segments to convert, right? But, and I suspect someone like Tishya might relate to that as well. But once you convert, the customer sort of stays put, sort of like an SIP in a mutual fund for a long time, right? So I think one of the things that I think in programmatic, we haven't sort of gotten around to is not just look at the end scorecard, Right, which is conversion, clicks, et cetera, et cetera. But how do I, A, look at things like priming, right, awareness creation, repeat engagement rates, and finally, action, and then, you know, the outcome, right? Like, this would be the equivalent of you tracking, let's say, a player's journey saying, is this fellow going to the gym? Is he getting up in the morning? Is he doing fitness training? Before you start tracking runs, I think we've just gotten to a point where everyone is just getting so obsessed with the runs <laughs> and the outcome. We're saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you swing for the fences, right? Or, you know, if you're a dodo, uh, it doesn't matter as long as you hit a six, that's all matters, right? I think to me, because simply because, and the reason why I'm sort of insisting that has to happen, uh, where I guess people feel a lot more comfortable spending on a Google or a Facebook is you have a lot more sort of control over the control over visibility of the attribution that happens, right? The problem with programmatic, uh, you know, is, is that you're sort of buying stock from an unknown face, right? If anything, I can't run the, run the same scorecard that I'm running while I'm buying from a known face, which is Google or Facebook in this case. You have to give me a lot more comfort, right? Sort of like what Ola or Uber say, hey, you know, this fellow has started, he's gonna reach you in three minutes, he's a four-star rated driver, et cetera, et cetera, right? For example, for a starter, I always think when we run programmatic, why don't we get like a scorecard or an NPS of the quality of the publisher, which is an all blended sort of scorecard. That makes me allocate a lot more to him, right? If you're just gonna tell me this is CPM, then this is available. I won't know whether the quality of that is good enough for me, relevant for me, et cetera, et cetera. And how has my own sort of inventory performed in the past with him, right? Is there a better way for you to sort of at least give me a score? Yeah. I mean, whatever, an NPS equivalent, say this is what you should be doing. For example, there are so many nuances that are missing, right? You know, if, for example, uh, we keep getting this feedback that, you know, the moment we overlay, let's say, a big basket audience, conversion rates go up dramatically. Because you see big basket audience, you obviously overlay big basket audience, the guy is tipping over into buying, right? Whereas, let's say, for example, a YouTube, I don't know what, do it yourself, salon channel, I suspect will be a lot more of awareness. So you'll have a larger funnel, a longer time of engagement slash dwell time, but not as good an outcome from a sales perspective, right? So how do you allocate money to each of this? I think these are questions I'd imagine have to get addressed. And this becomes even more so relevant because with generative AI, I think you're gonna have a lot of these dynamic creatives. So, you know, just the supply chain of how many creatives you're gonna to want to test with and how do they look like to you at different points of time in your journey? And hence, how do you respond to them over a period of time uh, just becomes a lot more complex. So three things, I think, look at a longer time frame, look at the full funnel of engagement, not just the outcome, right? Three, uh, what are sort of improvements in trust, right, that you can create for people to sort of trust each other on both sides. 
Thank you so much, Varda. So, yes, brilliantly put. Those are the three points. And then, you know, uh, Tishya, I wanted to check with you on while Varada has spoken about where we are and what is, what is the ideal strategy to approach this challenge, how are we working around these challenges and where are we right now as an industry? So your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, just to take a step back, why did we ever go on programmatic, right? Because when I have a campaign, I'm delivering across Spotify, across OTT, and there is unlimited frequency happening. The same consumer could be seeing the ad multiple channels. You could be bombarding them, right? So the big thing programmatic does is put a frequency cap where the X consumer is seeing an ad only a certain number of times. And then at the end, as a marketer, I can go back to my DB360 and say, okay, this campaign drove these many impressions and this much reach. And that data is to some extent deduped. Right? So there is a big attribution problem which is already kind of solved. Of course, there are a lot of conversations. Should we do last click attribution? Should you do seven day attribution, 15 day attribution window? All of those conversations will continue to happen. But to some level, I will say at least campaign tracking has become more efficient. Uh, that's the number one thing. The number two thing is that as we have been collecting first party data and PII, and you know whether it is as simple as making a lookalike audience on Meta, uh, or it is uploading this audience on DB360 and using this similar audience rather than affinity on in-market audience, PII and 1P data is typically more efficient. It, that you know you would have seen it across different industries. Now the question is how do you collect high quality data, right? So whether it is a company like L'Oreal starting a D2C, which is really the highest quality data where you can seg segment consumers, you get so many insights about them. Uh, and then of course, how do you upload this data and then use it across different, different segments? Um, so that's the number two thing. And the number three thing is that more than being data centric or anything, we are forever consumer centric. Right, so the question for us will ever remain that if I have a campaign, how do I make sure that my ad on a digital out of home versus a gaming platform versus YouTube are different and they are based on what the consumer needs at that time. So that's really the challenge that we are forever trying to solve as, as digital marketers. And of course, then of course we have brand safety concerns and there are lots of you know, um, the ways to put pre-bid filters, post-bid filters, and, and I'm sure we'll discuss that a little bit in detail. But these are the three, four things which are kind of going on right now. Thank you, Tisha. So touching upon brand safety concerns, yes. So I remember that Deepak and uh, Lala Tendu already mentioned about uh, the ideal way to buy media while looking at these filters as well. So if you could just, uh, Lala Tendu, if you could just share your thoughts on uh, the brand safety, ad fraud, and viewability state of the industry, and how, what kind of workarounds should we be looking for? Of course, we have our partners in place, and then these partners are doing the best that they can. Digital is never 100% when it comes to brand safety. The entire digital, and it's not only programmatic. But then your thoughts on what are the what is the strategy we should adopt towards ensuring that we are as close to that 100% as possible? No, I'll just start with this. Um, look at this BAV if you really need it, because I sometimes feel many people just do it out of FOMO. Ki yar, wo kar raha hai, make you nikar raha, right? So first get that right, but if you really want to do this, uh, there are a few things you can do in available technologies which is there. For example, take DB360 for, for that matter. The basic keyword exclusion, the blacklisting of sites, making sure that your art doesn't appear in a cancer phase because it creates a negative emotion. These are already there. It's a matter of awareness, right? Now, if you take the next level, uh, right, and you have, let's say, a, a post-bid validation, like double verify. Even if something really passes through your filters and you want double verify to stop it at the last moment of, uh, you know, ad appearing, those technologies are available also. Think of uh, mfilter it as a, as a fraud prevention. So there, there are multiple technologies available. I would just summarize this point is, don't do this out of FOMO first thing. Uh, second, just be very crisp as a business owner on why are we doing this and what's the ROI, uh, as, as they really uh, nicely said it. And once you have figured out where you want to play, uh, just be aware of all the options available. And, and my read is there's quite a few options that are available there, right? 
Uh, and if, if somebody tells that, you know, it's very difficult to do on programmatic, uh, maybe they need a second opinion. Thank you. So, yeah, Ritika, your thoughts on this? See, um, of course, one needs to be careful. Um, and you cannot be uh, okay about the fact that, you know, your ad gets served into, uh, an, you know, negative or unassociated, uh, you know, content conversation. But I, even I feel like the best uh, ad safety platforms which are available today don't give us 100%, you know, uh, assurance of, or nobody takes that guarantee. I don't know if there is anybody actually who takes that guarantee because I haven't come across any, right? Um, but that said, I mean, you get sharper at it. Like, so for example, all these keywords, uh, we definitely try and block. Uh, I think with, um, then you as an advertiser need to be a little more sharper in terms of what you want, where you want to, where you're okay to advertise and where you're not okay. Then play within an absolutely walled environment. Um, and if you have that risk-taking ability, go ahead. 10, 15% is not going to hurt anybody. You know, well, we live with that, right? Uh, but yeah, there is nobody who's right now giving you a 100% guarantee. So that's my thought. Thanks, Ritika. So uh, Deepak, uh, your thoughts on uh, the omni-channel approach we should be taking. Because when we are talking about the journey of programmatic, the growth that we have seen, the first thing that comes to my mind is the multiple channels that have been added to it. Now we are talking about CTV, native, or audio and display. You know, display and video were always a part of it, but then we have added audio. Now, with all of these conversations, which digital out of home coming into the picture, now, what strategy should we adopt and what should people look for when they talk about an omnichannel strategy using programmatic? No, I think great question because uh, everybody is finally going after eyeballs, right? And uh, it's the same consumer who's moving across medium, across devices at different points of the time. Uh, what you do on a weekend is very different than what you do on a weekday. I remember there was a time when most of the shopping uh, sale used to happen on the weekends. Uh, now it all moved to weekdays because we all realize that people have better things to do on weekends than you know go and, and figure out uh, what to buy. And I think these are the kind of things today we are seeing. And, and that's why the biggest challenge today is about understanding customers' value of time and how customers are spending that. Uh, during COVID, uh, when I'm looking from programmatic or otherwise, I think all of us had spent a lot of time in front of screens. Uh, either people were doing Zoom calls or watching content on OTT, or they were doing FNO transactions, or probably making searching for another job, but screens were primarily there because you had no other alternate activity outside home, right? So I think once things opened, as we started to travel, be here in the meetings, eventually all our screen times have come down. Uh, so I think that, and when you start taking that as the basis to say, if I'm spending less time on the screen, and if my programmatic is irrespective of form factor, it's all around screens, how do you go back and relook at that? Uh, classic example, when we talk of OTT as a, as a medium, right? Netflix data shows that people are spending less and less time in front of OTT. Last week I was in Australia and I was surprised to see that just like in India we had that 199 rupee package for buying Netflix on mobile. Even in, even in Australia that was there, even in a market with probably a population that is so small because they are struggling. It's not about people have access to larger form factors or screens and devices, but it's about the time. And, and I think as people are spending less time, finding a right mix is equally important. And the second shift I'm seeing is publishers are directly going and talking to the brands. They don't look at intermediaries. So if you are a credible publisher uh, where you know that it gets you the return, you don't need to go through that. So I think everybody today, the quality inventory uh, is available and it's available directly if you are buying. So then comes the question of if I'm now using a programmatic, if I know something works on a particular channel for me at a particular time, 
with a proven data and ROI as to who's viewing it, what are the conversion. And as I start mapping a lot of that real data, I do see there will be a challenge, even in the way programmatic will evolve. Uh, because the biggest search, for example, we all know in US on products is not on Google, it's on Amazon, right? So uh, similarly, it's about dining. You want to go and dine somewhere, you don't, don't go and search anymore on Google, so the world. So I think people are increasingly going to find the discovery and consumption at the same place. And thereby, the ability not just to push an ad through programmatic becomes important, but also your ability to convert those into the consumption and the output. And that's why I was talking about ROI and technology, because the marketing function has to coexist with how the product journeys will get delivered and completed. For example, I see a great ad of L'Oreal, but if I cannot go and buy the product then, uh, then the conversion matrix will never justify whatever I would have done probably at the front end. And thereby, when we choose these mediums today, if they are interactive mediums, in my mind, will continue to get a higher throughput. And that's why while we have smart TVs, which are becoming smarter, but can they end up becoming the way through which I can shop, buy, convert? If that happens, I think we will start seeing some of those mix of uh, channels that today we have transform. And that's why I said it's a journey because the product delivery and discovery all has to get embedded uh, for programmatic really to scale with quality of inventory that we have. And I think all the B and C and those who do not really match up to this level, I, I think it's fair that they should die and they will. I just want to add to Deepak. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Deepak just made uh, Varda's job a lot more easier. You know, he just <laughs> said like, where people are consuming, that's where the discovery is really happening. <laughs> so, yeah, great. So, um, basically, I just want to add to Deepak. So, I think programmatic is just a, a platform, right? It it allows uh, you know advertisers to reach out to a much larger audience, um, and and which is not the wall gardens. So if you want to reach out to anybody outside of the meta, Google, Amazon world, programmatic is the way to do it because it's all of the other publishers put together. So instead of marketers you know, having to go through the pain of reaching out to one and every publisher on a separate, uh, you know, with a separate media plan and which takes up a lot of the time, you're just reaching out to the entire universe outside of the wall gardens in one shot. So it, it makes you know, advertising agencies, marketers' lives much easier. It uh, allows them to target the right audiences because you can add your first party data, your second party data, use third party data from you know, aggregators that are already inbuilt into the programmatic landscape. You can use their data, you can set up your frequency caps, you can just use every capability that a tech platform has in one platform. So it's simplifying, according to me, it's just simplifying everybody's lives. Uh, with you know, uh, whatever you need, you just pick and choose and then apply it. Also, uh, you know, adding on to your brand safety and other uh, tools, I think you know, when publishers do their checks, they'll say that, okay, we've, we've got so-and-so tools that we use, or we know that our audiences are safe, our content is brand safe, and so on. Within programmatic, you, know, you have the SSPs, you have the DSPs who are also adding in a layer, an additional layer um, of using tools like WhiteOps or Pixelate or you know, um, Double Verify, where they're looking at how do we scan that traffic again and then make sure that it's brand safe, make sure that you know, there's no other uh, irrelevant content that you don't wanna be around. So um, yeah, that's, that's the challenge and that's the uh, solution uh, that comes with programmatic. Thanks Priya, thanks Deepak. So um, Varada, uh, you know, we have spoken about, uh, a lot about the data that goes in, the targeting that we should be doing, the publishers, you know, the strategy that we should be adopting, the channels. But then what about the end user? Because privacy is definitely a conversation that's on everybody's minds. And uh, with people being more and more aware of what they want to see, you know, uh, how would you, you know, the way I think is that privacy it takes utmost priority, obviously. But then, what is the fine line that a marketer should walk to ensure that the user wants to see the ad versus a user who does not want to see the ad and still be able to be relevant because that is what programmatic is all about. We want to be relevant. So how do we walk that fine line? 
Yeah, the first part of the question, user wants to see that, does not want to see that. I think that's probably, I suspect, above all of our pay grades, right? You know, I think these are, there are different regulations floating around, uh, you know, consent in, consent out, negative tracers, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess we'll probably flow with what I guess Indian regulation sees, so, right? I think the second part of the question, which is, which is like, uh, you know, how do you sort of track action? How do you rather speak to someone? without spooking him, right? But at the same time, be thoughtful about it, right? I'll give you a couple of examples because, you know, in, uh, you know, as a part of my job, I get to talk to a bunch of people, including, let's say, somebody in Kroger's, Albertsons, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if I talk to you saying, Sashitar, uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm sorry, you're also losing hair, so <laughs> I'll take that, you know, example, right? Say, hey, you know, you're losing hair, right? Whatever you bought last week is not working. Try this. You'd probably get up and down. Right? Obviously you did, I'm sure, you know, there's, there's a small part of you that sort of got ticked. But however, if I sort of reframed it, mm -hmm. saying this is the hair treatment, anti-hair fall treatment or whatever, right? That people in your geography, and I won't, I'd probably say, I probably won't say city, I suspect I'd probably say Koramangla or Bandra, have used, sorry, have bought in the last one week, is trending. Mm -hmm. It's a little more acceptable. You see where I'm going with this? I think the right level of contextuality from what I've sort of at least uh, you know gathered so far is talk to you at the level of a cohort that you would like to be associated with, which broadly is not controversial and does not indicate very strong views or opinions about you. I know it's a very convoluted sort of statement, but you get the drift. Like, for example, I think it's okay to say, hey, you know, today's a hot day in Bo Bombay. How about some buttermilk, mm -hmm. right? But people don't seem to say, think you you were buying a lot of I don't know what acidic food, right? Uh, acidic stuff. Uh, buy buttermilk, right? I think there's this sort of right way to, you know, put, you know, sort of it talk. I think the problem that most people seem to have, right, because I've worked on both right and left left brain marketing, is people think the data cut is the way you ought to be communicating. The data cut means nothing to the customer. He's interested in his psychographic cut, the cohort that he belongs to, right? Saying I'm a cricket fan is doing gross injustice if you're a cricket fanatic, and is doing gross injustice if you're a if you're just a, you know, if you're just a cricket watcher, you know, couch potato, we couldn't, right? So I think that's, to me, the big sort of unresolved part. What Priya talked about, I think the basics are all in place. Think of it like this. I think the plumbing is in place. I think the way the water seems to be coming out, right? Someone sort of wants, a, someone wants water out of a jacuzzi or giving him a hand shower and vice versa, right? I think that contextualization has been sort of still coming. I suspect with AI and LLM, it's going to be a lot more easier. Can I just come in here? Yes. I think just want to add two bits. I think this area again will go through massive change. It's already with uh, digital personal data protection bill. It's, it's the core of it. And I think uh, marketeers have to start going back along with the data privacy and the tech team yeah. uh, because uh, the data for the purpose for which it's getting collected, uh, the end use of data, uh, the fiduciary responsibility to ensure that uh, not just you, but if you are using partners and vendors who in turn are going to work with you, and if they have a mishap, you are accountable. And I think then the anonymization and encryption of data uh, to ensure that just like you mentioned, uh, personal identifiable data has to completely be masked and done away with. So I think all of that will create added complexity to the level at which you will be able to do personalization and do more targeted stuff because uh, customers can always come back and say, this is not a consent I've given. How did you know that yeah. this is a product I needed or this was a shoe? And I think we have had, had enough stories in the past of how you know some of the agencies knew what is the next product you're going to buy uh, even before the need arose or how Domino's knows that who's going to place. Or I think, uh, so this is going to be a very interesting space of how you combine privacy, but still continue to look at a sharper targeting. Thank you, Deepak. So, yes, uh, 
Varada, you had a lot of examples to share, and that was brilliant, actually. And uh, uh, same with Deepak. So privacy is important, and we want to prioritize privacy. It is equally important for the brands and agencies, eventually the marketers, to understand who is the user we want to reach out to and identify the line which we need to walk to reach out to that user without spooking them, the way Varda put it. I still remember a conversation which I had with uh, uh, a person. He was asking me, it was in a flight, he was asking me, what do you do? I got to explaining a little bit, we struck up a conversation. And he asked me, okay, tell me one interesting campaign that you have done or else some interesting strategy that you have adopted. So there was this, uh, I explained to him how we tapped into the local dealer network based on pin codes and then on the phone screen, when the user tapped on buy now, he would be connected to the local dealer. This was not a product that was sold online. So this was more of uh, an automobile uh, brand. So it was a test drive. So the local dealer would get that number and the, the, his number would pop up on the user screen. The person said, that's really cool. A bit creepy, but really cool. <laughs> so <laughs> that is the fine line that we need to understand and you know, have that in our mind when we are talking about privacy understanding what is it the user wants, making sure that the users are educated about the data that they are sharing in bold words, and then coming back, collecting that data and reaching out to them for relevant advertising. Now we have spoken about all of these topics, but then one more topic which is being discussed by everyone right now, and I, I believe I just have time for one more question, so my apologies. I'll, I guess I'll go to uh, Priya with this one. So uh, Priya, your thoughts on sustainability? Because programmatic is a medium where we utilize ad servers, we utilize server integration so heavily that on an average, one ad slot gets about 7,000 hits per month. 7,000 per ad slot. This means that only across the top five economy, uh, you know, digital marketing uh, countries we are talking about 215,000 metric tons of CO2. So with this in mind, what steps are we taking as an industry towards sustainability and what does the future hold for us? Sure. So, you know, when you think of sustainability, I mean, advertising is one of the biggest uh, industries that contributes to uh, carbon emissions. So I'll give you an example. A $10,000 campaign run on any digital media would contribute to about two tons, two metric tons, of uh, carbon emissions, that is massive. That could be, uh, you know, an entire airplane flying for, uh, you know, four or five hour flight. So it is massive of how uh, we are contributing, um, you know, carbon emissions into the environment, and we definitely have to do something. So um, I think it's the responsibility of every company to look, first of all, look at what has been contributed by them. So it is important to measure what you're contributing. Only then you can offset. And there are multiple ways, and everybody would have their own strategy. But I'll, I'll give you an example of what OpenX did, because we're an SSP, we get you know, billions and trillions amount of data into our, our uh, data centers each, each month. What we did was we migrated to GCP, Google Cloud Platform. And my, that migration helped us to kind of you know, reduce our carbon emissions drastically. So that was the first step that we did. And, and that was more, it started off being more of a company decision to kind of bring down costs, uh, becoming more efficient, which attributed to us becoming uh, carbon neutral in a big way. And then we started from there, we started to build our other initiatives and we're now certified net zero. And there were a lot of other parameters that contributed to it, but every campaign uh, that an advertising agency wants to run with us, we actually would um, bear the cost of you know, offsetting that uh, if they want to run green media buys. And that's an initiative that we've taken because we want to not only just be net zero ourselves, but also want to help all of our other partners uh, to you know, go down that path. So sustainability is something everybody needs to look at it from their own perspective, as well as help their partners to achieve that status themselves. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so my two cents, on this topic again would be that, you know, sustainability is definitely an initiative we should be looking at, but then some practical, some more practical steps to add to uh, what you just mentioned would be uh, looking at identifying the smallest possible supply chain, the least number of hops that we can 
in reaching the eventual user. That, we, that is one way to reduce it. So SPO is a big part of the conversation here, and uh, we should definitely be looking at it as one of the options, one of the short-term options to proceed with this while the overall sustainability conversation picks up pace and we go towards a net zero goal. Well, uh, well uh, thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your thoughts on uh, the topics. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience for any of the panelists or myself? Well, thank you so much.